thank you thank for you. joining us again. And welcome, Lisa. It's good to see you here. Hi, good to see you too. Thank you for having me on. Appreciate you getting up so early in Australia to be with us. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So you wrote an amazing series on getting Julian Assange and the psychology behind it. Um, for those readers who haven't read your series, can you outline some of the major basic sort of points that you made in that series to just get them up to speed? Sure, yeah. Well, I mean, I set out just to write one article and it, you know, there was so much in it that it ended up expanding out into five parts. Um, and it kind of it turned my mind to it after going to a rally in Sydney last year, a free Assange rally. Um, you know, and I expected there to be coverage of the rally. I expected it to be bad and biased and, you know, part of an extension of the smear campaign that's been going, you know, for so long. Um, but there was no coverage. There was a blackout. So people didn't know that the rally was on. They didn't know that the rally had been on. And that really kind of drove home to me how coordinated and how um, comprehensive, you know, the kind of media campaign against Julian Assange and WikiLeaks is. Um, and at that rally, John Pilger spoke. So it was really it was really amazing that it wasn't covered at all. You know, Julian Assange is an Australian citizen. He's at the centre of Russiagate. That's, you know, all anybody talks about in, in the corporate media. John Pilger's a really well-known Australian. Silence, absolute silence that he's there speaking, you know, in support of Julian Assange and WikiLeaks. So um, John Pilger talked about, you know, the, the smear campaign and some of the low points in Australian journalism around that. And he put it in the context of a 2008 Department of Defence document that outlined a plan to destroy the trust at WikiLeaks Centre of Gravity, that was their words. So I came away thinking, wow, that's quite a psychological project for the Defence Department, you know, to go after trust in a publisher. Um, you know, is that a psychological operation? Not something that I knew an awful lot about and started looking into that and the relationship between psychology and, you know, the national security state. The current sort of status of that, the history of that, I was looking at job ads for psychologists on the CAA website, you know, to see. And you're a psychologist yourself, Lisa. You I should. am, yes. Yes, I should say I'm a psychologist and I'm also a columnist for an Australian news website called New Matilda. I've been doing that for a few years. And before psychology, I studied media studies and sociology. So I've always had an interest in the interaction between psychology and politics and media. Um, and for that reason, I guess, quite an interest in propaganda and opinion shaping and the psychology of media. So yeah, I was turning my mind to all of this from that background. Um, and my PhD in psychology concerned the psychological processes by which one person influences another's beliefs about reality. Um, I mean, I was interested in false confessions at the time, so it was about how an interrogator can sort of shape the content of an interviewee's beliefs and memories, um, both. So, you know, but so the same processes basically apply in opinion shaping on a mass scale. I mean, when I started looking into, you know, the relationship between psychology and intelligence agencies and, and the media, um, I was uh, looking into counterintelligence. You know, this is a cyber counterintelligence branch that set out to destroy trust in WikiLeaks and um, read, I think also on the CIA website, that um, one of the main aims of counterintelligence is to exploit, leverage and exploit adversary vulnerabilities and I thought well knowing a lot about the vulnerabilities in human reality processing given my PhD and my background I can see all over this decade-long smear campaign against Julian Assange and WikiLeaks that that's really what's happened you know that the vulnerabilities in human reality processing have been leveraged and exploited and you know the adversary in that relationship is the public, you know, media consumers, WikiLeaks consumers. So I thought, look, I'll write about that. I'll write an article about those vulnerabilities, about how I see them having been exploited. Um, but in order to do that, I sort of had to, I felt established that, A, there was a smear campaign and that it wasn't just, you know, journalistic um, failures and jealousy, that it was a, a coordinated, planned thing that... Um, I mean, if, you know, we can't sort of get behind the scenes and there's been no leaks about that. So if WikiLeaks had a leak on that, we would we would know. But 
Um, but looking at it from the outside, you know, I guess I just see the sort of the signs of psychological knowledge all over the smear campaign. Um, and I talked about, so in talking about the history between psychology, oh, the relationship between psychology and intelligence services, I talked about, started out by talking about torture um, and John Kiriakou, who's coming on his role in exposing torture. Um, and it's a bit of a, a case study in um, A, the importance of whistleblowing, B, what happens to whistleblowers who aren't protected by an organisation like WikiLeaks. You know, John Kiriakou was the one who went to jail for exposing the horrific torture program that psychologists were complicit in designing and implementing, which is a really shameful, shameful episode in um, the history of the psychology profession. Uh, but, you know, the, the two psychologists who were responsible for that walked away with an $81 million contract for their consulting company, no criminal repercussions. They got to go on TV and justify torture and endorse Gina Haspel as CIA director. And meanwhile, John Kiriakou was sent to jail. He had to watch the after um, John Kiriakou went on TV and, I mean, he's coming on so he can <laughs> tell the story better than me, but... Um, went on TV and said that, yes, waterboarding is our policy. It was contradicting George Bush at the time. The Senate Intelligence Committee launched a very comprehensive investigation into torture and a, a long report. Um, and John Kiriakou had to watch the release of that report from prison. So it's, it's a real, um, you know, it's a, a bit like Tim's experience. It's a real case study in, um, you know, the, the necessity of something, you know, an organisation like WikiLeaks and the importance of shining a light on these abuse of, abuses of power um, and the fact that, you know, you can't rely on the power structures to do the right thing when you do that. It's, it's happening to Tim, it happened to John, the perpetrators get an $81 million contract, the person who blew the whistle ends up in jail and bankrupted defending themselves. So, um, so I sort of started there um, and, um, of course, you know, that's also was a way of talking about the importance of whistleblowing to democracy. You know, because John Kiriakou opened, opened the door on, you know, the window on what was going on at the CIA and in the psychology profession, you know, that torture program came to an end. Um, and who knows how many more people would have suffered if he hadn't have done that. And so... You know, it's an example of what WikiLeaks provides to democracy and society and the importance of whistleblowing to journalism and to the public and to the integrity of, you know, democracy in our society. Um, and so in the next article, I talked about, oh, sorry, it's also, I also talked about it as a, a sort of a case study in CAA psychology, you know, and the kind of, um, uh, you know, what Julian Assange what we can expect, the sort of treatment we can expect Julian Assange to receive if he is extradited to the United States, given that, you know, torture was going on behind the scenes and, um, you know, who knows what else is going on that's waiting for Julian Assange. So, um, you know, it's a reason to be alarmed just, just on a human rights basis and, a, you know, Julian Assange's welfare basis. Um, so then the next article I thought, well, before I get into the psychological nitty gritty of this smear campaign, I'll talk about, um, you know, some of the myths that it's promoted and debunk those. Um, so I was talking there about the importance of omission in psychological operations and propaganda. It's very important to keep out material that contradicts the narrative you're trying to push. And so I, I went through some of the major omissions, like the sort of detail of the Swedish investigation and what really went on there. Um, and at the moment, one of the major omissions in the media, I mean, there's, there's so many, but on WikiLeaks is, as you guys have talked about a lot on these vigils, you know, the consequences for media, for free speech, the dire precedent that it would set for, um, you know, public interest journalism and any kind of... Um, systemic critique of the corporate state and of the billionaire classes that rule us and own the media to make sure that they can keep on ruling us and people you know don't don't uh, know what's going on um so you know i talked about that and i mean people who view these vigils regularly will know that there's been warnings from you know current and former senior new york times council that 
prosecuting Julian Assange would criminalise journalism. Um, you know, Human Rights Watch and Committee to Protect Journalists and ACLU are all on the same page about this. It's not in the media, though, not in the establishment media. And so in the third part, well, in talking about that, I sort of I was talking about Russiagate and um, it was before the Mueller report had um, been finalised. And, you know, Trump opponents and people who've bought into Russiagate and people who are, you know, um, getting behind the pursuit of WikiLeaks for that reason, blaming Julian Assange and WikiLeaks for Trump's election, feeling so enraged about that, wanting, you know, wanting some revenge, I think, is part of it. Um, um, and I talked about the fact that in that equation, people are placing their trust in intelligence agencies over WikiLeaks and, you know, that makes no logical sense. WikiLeaks has a, a almost unique, or probably is unique, record of 100% accuracy, whereas intelligence agencies have a long history of lies going back to, you know, day dot um that's such an so, important point yeah mm, mm. and you know now as the um as the you know accusation of trump's collusion with russia is falling apart my personal view of russiagate is that that's not russiagate failing from a psychological point of view i think the promise of bringing down trump was always kind of a psychological tease to get you know string people along bombshell after bombshell after bombshell so that Russiagate had two years in which to really lay down this narrative that American democracy is under attack from Russia and WikiLeaks is in on it and this is why we need to get Julian Assange. Um, and I have to say I'm digressing a little bit, but I'm on a psycholog psychological level, I'm a little concerned. I think it's a risk at the moment that, you know, people who were really invested in that and really invested in bringing down Trump and are now frustrated and disappointed that Julian Assange might become sort of psychologically a second prize, that that can be kind of by the opinion shapers harnessed and exploited to keep people behind this Trump administration pursuit of journalism via Julian Assange and WikiLeaks. As you all know, and viewers probably know, it's not just about Julian Assange and WikiLeaks, it's about suppressing, it's about internet censorship and suppressing genuinely independent journalism and um, so, you know, as, as, as in the establishment media, as they're talking about there being no evidence of Trump's collusion, they're taught, still repeating this narrative that has equally little evidence, as I know you guys know you were talking about it last week, um, that, um, you know, Russia hacked, um, rather than leak, you know, rather than being a leak, Russia hacked the emails and gave them to WikiLeaks, and that's being repeated and repeated. Um, so in part three, I talked to, and, and that basically comes from intelligence agencies and firms that are kind of intelligence cutouts with, that all have sort of ties going back to whether it's the NSA or the State Department or the Department of Defence or the CIA. So there's no evidence for that, um, that narrative that's powering this pursuit of WikiLeaks, but nobody's talking about that in the establishment media. It's being talked about as if it's established fact, as if we know that that's what happened um, and, you know, that really keeps the pursuit of Julian Assange alive. So psychologically for people who bought into Russiagate. Um, so I in part three, um, sorry. Interrupt for a second, Lisa. Sure. There, was, there was a study this week that said that 50% of Americans still believe there was collusion. Mm, mm, <clears> even despite... What does that tell you? Mm -hmm. <laughs> in the context well, of what you're telling us. Yeah, yeah well, it's, that kind of illustrates what I was saying through the articles when I got into the psychological nitty-gritty of propaganda and how people's beliefs about reality are manipulated and how intelligence agencies for, you know, it seems like at least 50% of people have co-opted trust um, from WikiLeaks to the intelligence agencies and how on earth did they do that? Um, so in the, when I get into the the... the Nitty gritty of that, talk about the fact that it's a really widely underappreciated fact that human reality processing, reality perception isn't the logical, factual endeavor that we all experience it to be and think that it is. I mean, of course, it can be, it's possible to 
of course, process the world in a rational, logical, fact-based way. But it's really all human cognition is what psychologists call motivated cognition. So it serves a lot of goals as well as um, accuracy. So that's true of memory. It's true of political reasoning. It's true of perception of reality. So that 50% fits with that in that people don't make their judgments about what's true and what's not necessarily based on evidence, unless accuracy is really their goal, and in which case they'll be more careful about how they process things. So um, there are sort of that gets into vulnerabilities in human reality processing and how they can be and are, um, you know, leveraged and exploited in propaganda and in the media and opinion shaping and smear campaigns. And so I talk about in the articles the two main levels being a, a sort of a deeper motivational um, goal-directed meaning-oriented level which determines which versions, versions of reality we're susceptible to being fed. Um, and I think that's where that, well, but, so there's that level and then there's the, a technical level which is more about how the narratives are deployed. So that's that exploits efficiency-oriented vulnerabilities. So our brain often sacrifices accuracy just for speed. So things like repetition, just repeating something over and over and over and over and over and over causes us to take it as real. So, you know, Russiagate and the smear campaign going on 10 years uh, has exploited both of those levels. Um, and I think that, Joe, that 50% belief um, still believing it is because the it's had there's been two years for vulnerabilities at both those levels which i can go into in more detail what, what they are but two years for those to be exploited relentlessly and repeatedly and what happens in the end is that really there's a saying that people feel and smell and taste the truth so what feels viscerally real to people is what they've been being told and what they've been um you know, kind of exploited to emotionally want to believe for two years. So a confirmation bias kicks in where it doesn't really matter what evidence people are faced with, what contradictory facts they're faced with. It's this, the, the system, the, the brain, the psychological system just rejects it, just, just call you a, an apologist or a truth or, or anything to just push the reality away or find all sorts of rationalisations and justifications to hang on to the original beliefs or the, the beliefs that have been kind of, you know, consolidated and entrenched over, it's really kind of more than two years that there's been a Russophobic narrative going on, but with respect to Russiagate. Um, so, yeah, I don't know if you want to go into the, well, that's a bit more than an overview. <laughs> okay. No, that, no, that's great. Thank you for, for going over that. And I think it's really incredible like, the way that you've diagrammed that this is not just fake news, that it's just so important that these narratives have been pushed for so long. And I think mm. it's great from your perspective to tell the audience that, it, you know, with your experience is really important. Yes, because there's a lot at stake. I mean, I agree with everything that was said here. I agree with you, Joe. that I think, um, I mean, essentially, I mean, you've said this on these vigils too, that they're, the billionaires are in charge, they own the government, they own the media, um, and Tim's right at that at the center of that and the rock at the center of that you know the um sort of charade of american democracy um so good on you fighting that fight tim it's so important it's, sh you know, it's just tragic Absolutely. that you yeah tragic that you're not getting media coverage um but i see why you're not you know you and john kiriaki i can see why both of you aren't covered because you're both very sympathetic likable characters and people would get behind you and they would really care about your plight and um, it would, you know, it would be terrible for the, the people who need to hang on to power in a corrupt way. Um, um, so, sorry, I lost track of the Lisa, question. Well, um, part four is titled, mm. Why Even Some Lefties Want to See Assange Hang. Mm. Can you talk mm. a little bit about that? Yes. Well, in that's where I get into the the motivational vulnerabilities that have been exploited. Um, and I mean, there are a few, a few reasons for that motivationally. And it's been most obvious, obviously, since, um, you know, the 2016 election. Um, so the main, 
one of the main vulnerabilities I talk about there is, um, well, two main ones, I guess, a, a thing called system justification and group-based processes. Um, and perhaps the group-based processes is most relevant to the left-right issue, although in 2016 they both were. So human beings are really, it's really deeply wired to view ourselves in the world in group-based terms and hang our identity on our group memberships. I mean, some people more than others. Um, and, you know, there's loads of literature about the destructive sort of impulses and motives that come from that. If, if groups are put into competition with each other, if people are placed under a circumstance of threat or fear, competition, um, it's, it's unfortunately quite deeply wired into human beings to become aggressive towards the other groups. So you've got your own sort of the social cultural groups that you belong to and the other ones that, are, that gets called the out group in psychology. Um, and when people are frightened enough, threatened enough, the impulse towards the act group can become very violent, very callous. It's sort of a fight to the death kind of primal cave person kind of a, a wiring. It's, you know, it's, I mean, pretty much all intergroup atrocities trace back to that in some way, whether it's war or torture or um, prejudice and discrimination. Um, so, the campaign against Julian Assange has really leveraged that to the hilt by trying to define him, just trying to get the left on board against Julian Assange by defining Assange and WikiLeaks as being on the right or being anti-egalitarian, whether via the Swedish investigation, um, um, you know, brand, branding Assange as, you know, um, sexist and everything that somebody who was egalitarian would dislike and be angry about. Um, and then in the context of the 2016 election, linking WikiLeaks with Trump and with the alt-right and every flavour of right you can think of. Um, and that's been really exploited to harness all of those aggressive, um, uh, you know, um, violent... Level, yeah, yeah. Visceral yeah. anger, yeah. Yeah, and another thing about that for reality perception is that even if you get people and divide them into groups based on the colour of their T-shirt, they will perceive the member of the other group as in, in a negative light, as untrustworthy, dishonest, unlikable. It's just so wired, unfortunately, into human psychology. So defining Julian Assange and WikiLeaks as an out-group makes it a lot easier to, um, you know, to implant the smears and perpetuate their narratives because people are inclined to see act group members in a negative light so it feels more real um, and um, then therefore it's taken as more real um, and in terms of the 2016 election there's a process called system justification which i think is hugely it's not i don't just the people who do the research into system justification say it's profoundly influential psychological variable in um, politics and political information processing. And that is uh, a tendency, there's lots of research into this that people have to view their, their social systems, economic, political systems in a favourable light, just like we're motivated to view ourselves in a favourable light, but, you know, by and large, not all the time, but on average most of the time. Um, we engage in self-enhancing biases. So the same thing happens at a political level. So people tend to view their societies as good and right and fair and just and it's other people's societies that are corrupt and anti-democratic and um, abusive. And one counterintuitive finding of that research that's very consistent is that when people are confronted with flaws in their systems, like, like they are when WikiLeaks has a release or like they were in 2016 when it was revealed that the elections were being rigged, that there were these private speeches to Wall Street making these promises, that there were public and private positions, that, um, you know, they were very damning about American democracy, as is Tim Canova's experience. Um, and for people who are system justifying, which is more the norm than to be system questioning, when confronted with those flaws, rather than critiquing the system, what people tend to do is double down on the system's legitimacy. So you can end up in this sort of ratcheting, um, 
a system where people become more and more closed to reality the more that they're confronted with flaws in their systems. So they sort of bolster and defend the status quo when they're faced with or confronted with its failures and flaws. We and definitely that has been... seem to see that so so often as a result of this Russia Gate scandal and the mm. attack on WikiLeaks for sure. Absolutely. Okay. Yeah, that's been leveraged to the hilt with WikiLeaks. I mean one of the things I say in the well, so in, in 2016 it was American democracy that was exposed as flawed. And Russiagate has just doubled down on the sanctity of American democracy and this holy institution of American democracy is under attack by evil Russia and you always need a foreign bogeyman. It used to be, um, you know, Islam in the war on terror. Now it's Russia in great power conflict. Um, And, you know, before that, when WikiLeaks, um, when WikiLeaks um, released the 2010 Afghan and Iraq war logs, then the the response then was to double down on the sanctity of the US war machine and it was under attack by WikiLeaks that was said to have blood on its hands, you know, the, the US um, military is saying that Julian Assange has blood on his hands. It's, so that's that same thing. You, The very thing that's exposed as lacking, people are vulnerable to doubling down on the legitimacy of that. And then, you know, Vault 7, when the CIA was exposed, spying on us through our phones and our TVs, the CIA cast itself as under attack from espionage by WikiLeaks. So, again, you know, it's that, and it's a way to turn reality on its head, and that's been used with respect to WikiLeaks to get populations to a point now over 10 years where, you know, censorship is a bastion of democracy and free speech is a menace to be overcome. You know, that sort of was what um, Mike Pompeo was essentially saying in his speech about going after WikiLeaks' free speech values. Um, you know, and, uh, you know, war criminals are virtuous and their critics are corrupt and that's it's this real inversion. So I think system justifying tendencies are very important in that. And and in 2016, because it was the Democrat supporters who were the most confronted with those releases, that I don't think it was just the group-based stuff. I think that system justifying tendency and even sort of justifying the legitimacy of the Democratic Party kicked in as well and that was hugely exploited exploited in the Russiagate narrative um which is so counterfactual and so illogical (laughs) exactly and Um, I hate to interrupt but I have to add or say that what what you're diagramming and what you're describing you know it sounds like a maybe to some people it might sound like a indecipherable psychological term system justifying but what you're really doing is describing and dismantling the Orwellian sort of mindset Mm. that is kind Mm. of taking over Mm, mm. Yeah, up is and down and black incredible. is white and right. we are and you know so now we're in this situation where we're imprisoning a publisher for journalism he's not getting adequate medical care he's you know about to be well hopefully not but he's at risk of being you know extrajudicially extradited and um, detained and this extraterritorial pursuit and, you know, um, people are just tolerating it, <laughs> not seeing it as a really authoritarian, I mean, not everybody, but enough people are not seeing it as the authoritarian, um, you know, project that it is and how frightening it is for free speech and for democratic principles. So, yeah, and, um, you know, just to get back for a minute to that self-deception, the Orwellian, the kind of mechanism that we get into this Orwellian state, the, the researchers who are responsible for that program of research describe it as um, essentially a fundamental delusion that, you know, really can drive people to become quite delusional in their perception of reality and the perception of their societies to the point where our bombs drop democracy. It's only other people's bombs that, you know, that kill people. Yeah. Um, so that's... Um, That's part of that left-right, you know, bringing the left on board with this really authoritarian pursuit of free speech and journalism. So having a a two-party system like the U.S. has and driving out any possibility of a third party makes it easier for this to work, as you're describing. Absolutely. Absolutely. Yes. People... Yeah, people hive off into those two camps and that really does. And, and like you were saying, that lesser, lesser evilism and being frightened of the adversary, um, you know, having control or winning 
really tugs on those group-based processes. Yeah. Now, speaking of delusions, could you do an individual psychological analysis of a person? Uh, Rachel Maddow. <laughs> I can't. If I wasn't a psychologist, I could, but we can't comment on individuals. We have to. Yeah, I know. I, yeah. I figured you'd say that. So let's but go on to part five. <laughs> I won't keep you on that any longer. Yeah. I, I figured you'd say that. Uh, mm. Part five is about war propaganda 101. Yes. Yeah. So, yeah. So that was where I talked about the more surface level vulnerabilities that are exploited in propaganda and, you know, um, psychological operations like an attack on trust in a publisher um, and they're more so where is the motivational vulnerabilities will differ across people some people are more prone to those group-based processes or more prone to system justify the more technical vulnerabilities are pretty much just human um, they're kind of shortcuts that our brain takes in, when we're processing reality and they're very readily exploited in propaganda and are all the time and once you know them it's very easy to spot a serious propaganda campaign like Russiagate just as a lot of people have picked up like consortium news and disobedient media and other journalists picked that up right at the start it just screamed propaganda um, and there's some fairly simple things that opinion shapers can do to kind of hoodwink the brain into taking something as true and real regardless of evidence and fact and one is um well, one's just sheer repetition. You know, if you repeat something over and 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 over, it becomes very fluently processed, sort of like the world is round. You've heard it so many times before. You just take it as given. Um, in in milliseconds, it's in you know less time than it takes you to muster a conscious thought. Your brain decides, yep, that's true. I can rely on that. So the relentless repetition of um, of Russia Gates been part of that, and then. There's a thing called tagging that the brain does to um, to sort of orient us to familiar people and objects in the world, and it's quite a simple process of just emo using emotions to kind of tag people and things as good or bad. Um, when we encounter something repeatedly, our, our mind pairs it with an emotion that's associated with that person or thing, which might seem a bit, which means that um, a, a lot of our information processing is actually driven by emotions not by logic and there's neuropsychological research into this that emotions start to influence our thought and action within you know i think it's 10 milliseconds where it takes about a thousand milliseconds for conscious thought to kick in so pairing taking something and pairing it constantly with a particular feeling usually it's fear or anger or hate um, means that the minute people encounter that propaganda target, whether it's Russia or Julian Assange, they'll feel those emotions of hate or rage or resentment or even just um, indifference. And it means that any information that's consistent with that emotion is more readily taken in and received and experienced as true. So, um, you know, in, in Russiagate, there's just that relentless pairing of Russia with hacking, Russian hacking, Russian interference, Russian collusion, you know, Russian disinformation, and then pairing of Julian Assange with Russia, pairing of Julian Assange with Trump over and over and over and over and over again, so that everybody who's bought into Russiagate, they hear the name Julian Assange, they feel the same anger that they feel towards Trump, they feel the same anger that they feel towards Russia, they feel the same sort of lust for revenge or to topple him that they feel towards Trump. So... It's a very simple, sort of obvious thing, but it works, unfortunately, if people are, um, you know, susceptible to it, which, uh, uh, yeah, which people generally are unless they're in a mindset where they're really motivated to be accurate. Um, so if your goal is accuracy or if you mistrust the source, if you think, well, you know, I view MSNBC as, a propaganda outlet, I don't trust it, outlet, I don't trust anything they say, then it's not going to work because it comes with a feeling of mistrust. But if you trust the source, you don't have a reason to disbelieve it and you're not working really hard or particularly focused on being accurate. Um, it's, it's very effective. Um, and so one thing that's happened what, throughout with WikiLeaks, there's a, a concept that psychologists call symbolic threat. So there's real physical threat and symbolic threat is something that's a threat to your culture, your values, your way of life. Um, and when it was the war on terror, 
you know, Islam was paired with terrorism to, you know, to make people frightened of Islam and so any negative information about Islam would be received by the, you know, the information process of the brain, the reality system. Then, um, um, you know, Julian Assange was then paired with terrorism. So that, um, and, and now it's Russia and it's the same sort of tactic. Um, so symbolic, so Russia has been with this Russian hacking, Russian interference, Russian collusion, Russia's the main sort of symbolic threat now, it used to be terrorism, but now it's Russia, that they want to attack our democracy, our way of life, our values. And there's a fair bit of research around, you know, if somebody or something is perceived as a symbolic threat, people, it's, it's the same as any other kind of threat. People are more supportive of war, of torture. Um, they dehumanise the symbolic threat, which makes them callous to... The suffering of whether it was Muslims when it was the war on terror now and now Julian Assange um, because through Russia one of the things I see this sort of Russia um, Russia phobia is Russia phobia is being used for is Russia is now a symbolic threat and so Russia's taken and it just as a sort of propaganda brush with which to tar any kind of um, threat to the status quo as a symbolic threat also. Um, which makes people then callous towards any abuse of that target because of the dehumanisation. And that's been used relentlessly against Julian Assange. And I think that's part of why people are sitting around while his, his human rights are being abused, his health failing. The UN has said, you know, his life may even be endangered ultimately by this detention because he's not being adequately cared for medically. Um, and not to not to interrupt again, but I just oh, want to no, no. say that it's so amazing that um, that the success of RussiaGate, like mm. the success of the WMD narrative, Absolutely. is that what they intended or what 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 was really desired from those narratives did work. I mean, we had yes. the, the Iraq War, so even though they were debunked, they were successful in exactly. getting the message yep. that the establishment wanted. So, sorry to interrupt. It's, yeah, yeah, no, no, yes, interrupt away. <laughs> um, Excellent point. Yeah, it is. It is. It is an excellent point. Yes. And um, that's my concern with Russiagate supposedly falling apart. I mean, I understand people being excited and it is, you know, people who've been sceptical since the beginning being excited that there's no collusion, except I think Russiagate sceptics and people who've been pushing it back, back against it need to be careful to stay on the, the, the underlying narrative that's really trying to say that we're under attack from Russia and WikiLeaks is on it and we need to go after him and we need to go after, we need to censor the internet, we need to go after independent journalists who we're calling, you know, Russian propagandists. I think that's that and endless war, I think, are really possibly the two main purposes of this Russiagate narrative and they're perfectly well in place, with, you know, as you say, the, that um, the war on dissent is and journalism and independent um you know, voices is still there. <laughs> That's not going away with the Mueller report. Um, yes. And war and, yeah. and this attack on Russia is still with us. Mm. And you explained so well here why this has been dangerous in terms of geopolitics, this whole Russia Gate story. It's not just about an American election. It was about no. riling, up, riling up, particularly the American people and others in the West, against a nuclear on Russia. Mm. Uh, this is so dangerous. It is. Uh, uh, where people like Rachel Maddow, to bring her up again, even saying at one point that Russia had uh, uh, was responsible for shutting off the heat, mm. could shut off the heat of people in the Midwest during a cold spell. Uh, doesn't, there, I don't think she understood how, way of how life, much fire she was playing with. And there's a fair bit of your, analysis, around, your analysis, Lisa, you know, is somebody so or something so is perceived as excellent. A threat. You, you could easily, <laughs> you understand this so well, it's, it's you could easily get a hundred sixty-one million kind of dollar contract from the CIA. <laughs> war, torture. They'd love you to work um, for them. There's only uh, some good guys to work for, but. <laughs> but you know, also on an individual level, not just danger of war, but Russia, you could produce this lunatic who went and killed all those people in the mosques. Yeah. In oh. That's also a product of all of this, isn't it? Absolutely, yes. Well, yeah, I talked about that in part five to sort of illustrate this whole pairing and tagging process that it, it sounds simple and innocuous, but it's not because, um, you know, throughout the war on terror, that, that was used against Islam. 
just wrongly pairing Islam with terrorism over and over and over and over and over and over, and over, and over such that someone like, um, I'm sure there were other things going on for him, not just that, unhinged in other ways, but that that, um, that was a message he got from society and from the media and from politicians that, you know, that um, and, and the whole point of that pairing of Islam with terrorism was to justify slaughter throughout the Middle East, you know, the Iraq war, war in Afghanistan, Syria. I mean, it, you know, all of the atrocities that have been perpetrated throughout the Middle East. So, you know, the, I mean, the, that horrific massacre in, in Christchurch kind of illustrates what this is really about, what these smear campaigns and these um, propaganda campaigns against propaganda targets, that's what's on the other end of it. It is horrific violence and, and death like that. So you're right, Joe, it's, I mean, the consequences are absolutely... What do you think is the motive behind people uh, who launch these campaigns, like the CIA? They're doing it on behalf of others, not just for themselves. Yeah. I, I have an idea. What do you think? Why are they doing this? Well, my take on it all is that you know, there's a billionaire class that's uh, in charge now. They own, they, they fund politics, they own the media, war is extremely profitable. Um, you know, governments will pour trillions into it, well, the US government will. Um, and you need the media to manufacture consent for war because most people are good people who don't want to be responsible for killing other people. So you have to, you have to propagandise them into going along with it. So it's, you know, the billionaires need to own the media if they're going to get away with that. And then, you know, there's the economic exploitation. There's just the basically billionaires ruling, you know, to um, in, the, in their own interests at everybody else's expense, I think is probably the simplest way of putting it. And well, I think it's their interests, yeah. their interests, isn't it? They are protecting exactly. and furthering their interests mm. or to controlling a population that will not rise up against them and, mm. and be... Mm -hmm. And and uh, start thinking against the system, as you say, critically of the system. They can't yeah. have that. Yeah, or else is, their game is over. Exactly. So and that, that sort of uprising that you were talking about. This is independent journalists. We definitely value um, like. That's the risk. If, if independent media is allowed to thrive, if people sort of really catch on in a big way that they can learn the truth on the internet, um, you know, and Julian Assange and WikiLeaks can continue to reveal the corruption and the, abu the abuse. I mean, that's what's sort of likely to um, provide hope for the rest of us. You know, you're talking about being hopeless before. It's if people have information and can share information and communi communicate with each other and find out they're not alone in their experience of this, um, you know, neoliberal reality or plutocratic reality, that, that's a huge threat. So, um, uh, that's and why it's so important to shut down independent voices and, and systemic critique and oversight and accountability. Mm. And on that note, we're also going to bring in and welcome uh, George and Peter, who are we want to um, allow to ask you some questions as well. And, and Tim uh, as well. And Tim, me. yeah, Tim, if anyone please, has questions. If you've been listening, please join in an open discussion on what uh, Lisa's been talking about. Yeah, no, I appreciate it. And I had read Lisa's uh, five-part series as well. Um, it reminded me of um, sort of the political technique of swift voting, where you identify your opponent's strength and you uh, flip it against them. Mm. So it really just turns the entire world upside down. Yes. Yeah, I and, hadn't heard of that. It, sure. The swift voting um, it, it comes from uh, the 2004 presidential campaign between uh President George W. Bush, and he was uh, running against John Curry. Yeah. John Curry um, had been a Vietnam veteran, and he had been a decorated veteran during the Vietnam War, whereas Bush had been, I think, with the Texas Air National Guard and had apparently gone AWOL for some days. So the Republicans were expecting that to be used against Bush. So what they did was they essentially some group was formed called Swift Boats, uh, Swift Boat Veterans for Truth, and um, they um, their whole mission was to denigrate John Curry's war record and to cast doubt upon it, and to make it um, to, to change the narrative. Instead mm. of him being a war hero, he was somebody who made up his own uh, war record, uh, wrongly got purple hearts and things like that. And ever since then, the the word Swift Boating 
has become a verb for turning the narrative on its head, mm. politically speaking. Mm. Yeah, and it's reached such extreme, I and mean, it's gone to such extremes in the last two years, hasn't it? It's, 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 yeah, for me, watching it, it's almost been like a really sort of gruesome, enormous human experiment in just how far that can be pushed and just how upside down reality perception can be flipped. Kind of, exactly. Yeah. And, and how do you flip it back? Mm. Uh, you know, yeah. that independent voices and repetition from is, is what's needed. But it just seems like independent voices are always outgunned by the the mass media. Yeah, absolutely. That's that's the real problem, and it yeah it just comes down to it's almost a, a sort of a, a, just a practical problem of delivery and reach, and you know when that's monopolized. There's fantastic messages out there on independent media, and people I think are doing all the right things in terms of reaching people, but distributing distributing that to enough people is the challenge. Yeah. Well, it's also so important that, um, you know, professionals like yourself who are versed in this area diagram what it is mm. that you diagrammed in the series and tell us that this is a psychological operation and that this is manipulative and intentional, not just bad journalism, but intentional manipulation mm. of mm. the public. Yeah, yeah. I mean, that would be one really valuable thing that could come out of Russiagate if levels of propaganda literacy could be raised, you know, because if they were higher, people would have been onto that right from the beginning. You know, uh, Katie Johnson's been saying all along that uh, Russiagate was an effing yeah. psyop. <laughs> yeah. And, yeah. But you you have put a lot of bo meat on those bones, I just want to oh, say. That's good. that's good. Yeah, well, she's been right onto it from the beginning. There's been, you know, lots of fantastic people who have Jimmy Dore. There's a fellow called CJ Hopkins at Consent Factory. He's been sort of deconstructing it psychologically all the way through. and Consortium News, of course, and Disobedient Media and Black Agenda Report and, um, yeah. And Peter um, B. Collins on his radio show. Isn't that right, okay. Peter? Well, I suppose <laughs> so. Thank you, Joe. Yes. How are you today? I'm fine. Have you been hearing? I hope you heard some of the discussion we've been having. I have. Uh, I've, I've listened for the last 10 or 15 minutes, so I've caught up. And uh, I want to thank Lissa for her report earlier this week in my coverage, I paired it with Kevin Gostola's update on Chelsea Manning's uh, incarceration in solitary confinement. And we're, we're at a critical stage here. And if I may, I'd, I'd like to inject some criticism of the corporate media because- Oh no, it's not allowed, not allowed here. <laughs> Instant redaction. Despite the massive fail that is now clearly in evidence on Russiagate, uh, Dean Baquet, uh, the executive editor of the New York Times, uh, says he's proud of their coverage and uh, doesn't have anything to apologize for. And Jeff Zucker is busy counting the revenues at CNN and uh, doesn't have any time for any examination of their role in promoting this massive fraud. And the ripple effect, you know, I, I did a podcast, I'm just about to post it with Peter Van Buren, who's been on the vigil with you before. And uh, we had a good, good hour long chat about this today. And for me, the hypocrisy of the corporate media specifically related to WikiLeaks, where they were willing to publish material when they thought it would sell papers or glue eyeballs to a screen. But now that Julian and WikiLeaks have been demonized in this phony Russiagate narrative, and we blow past all of the important revelations that came from WikiLeaks that were exploited by this corporate media in their effort to get Trump. And now <clears throat> they are, <clears throat> pardon me, unapologetic, uh, MSNBC ha has barely recognized, uh, you know, the outlines of the Mueller report. They're busy saying, wow, 300 pages. There's got to be some really good shit in there. Uh, and they continue to mislead their viewers. And while those of us who are skeptical may have a moment of um, vindication or validation, we're paying a price for it because the effort to clean up the fake news 
much of which was promoted and profited on by these same corporate media outlets. <clears throat> that is all occurring at our expense. I'm not the only one who has lost traffic and no longer shows up in search, uh, you know, search results. And I post a podcast on Facebook and 13 people out of my thousands of so-called friends are permitted to see it. And so yeah. this is all part of, of a, a very big package. And we need to be relentless in pushing for you know, a just outcome for Julian Assange, in rejecting the characterizations that WikiLeaks is some extension of the Russian GRU. And we're caught in the crosswinds as Trump is attempting to capitalize on Bill Barr's uh, spin and filtering. And, and I accept the you know, general uh, notions of what Barr has, has passed along here. But we now have this period of time where Trump uncontested can promote this false notion that he was exonerated. And he's a corrupt motherfucker. And that corruption is very clear. He is impeachable, but the Democrats won't touch that because they don't think it will help them in 2020. And so we're, we're reaching a real crisis level here. And I believe fundamentally that justice for Julian Assange is a significant piece of trying to recapture some free speech rights and the momentum that independent media had before this whole scandal was dropped on us. So Lisa, do you have any, uh, well, Lisa, do you have any questions or comments on uh, Cassandra's experience uh, from, you know, as a, as a psychologist and after having written the series that you did? Well, it's Driving home to me, I mean, one thing that was going through my mind as, as I was listening to you speak, Cassandra, was, um, I mean, this is really something that psychologists should be, I think, speaking out about because we're talking about somebody here being, you know, being abused on so many levels, human rights being abused, civil and political and legal rights being abused. And um, it just seems like a logical place for psychology to be standing beside leading human rights organisations saying this is wrong, Human Rights Watch, Amnesty International, you know, the UN Working Group on Arbitrary Detention and Cassandra going and you going and visiting him, Cassandra, and, you know, explaining to everybody what it's like there really drives it home in a human way. Um, so I hope that that, you know, it's, uh, and it makes it more accessible and relatable to people. So I hope that will move some more people to, um, um, st you know, stand up and stand beside the organisations that are already denouncing this and saying that it's wrong to treat a journalist as a prisoner. Um, and I guess the other, the other thing there that really sort of invites psychologists to take a stand is that it sounds like they're trying to psychologically force him out, you know, make it so psychologically unbearable for him that he leaves. And that's another thing that was going through my mind as you were speaking. So, um, yeah, I think it's a really important story. For people to hear and I hope it I hope it moves some people who haven't come forth yet to come forth. Mm -hmm.